Hello and welcome everyone. So this is the first of two videos in which I'm going to discuss the topic of sweatshops. So in the first case, I'm going to talk about this uh, survey paper, a sort of field experiment paper where the authors elicited real consumers preferences for labeling of goods as having been produced under uh, good working conditions. And in the second video, I'm going to talk about Matt Zulinski's analysis, philosopher sort of analyzing the mainstream economic view or providing a defense of the mainstream economic view for sweatshops. Now, my view, my the, the big thing we want to accomplish in these two videos is to firstly use this first paper to kind of think about how people's how actual consumer preferences are shaped around and, and are activated around the topic of sweatshops, how people actually, how consumers actually feel in the marketplace. I think that's really interesting and really important. And the second part, thinking about in the second video, thinking about Zulinski's uh, arguments for sweatshops. So the, the point is like, you may agree or disagree, you may be convinced or unconvinced by Zulinski, can sort of lay a foundation with this video. And then the second one, the, the big thing is thinking about, well, what are the relevant assumptions? If you agree with Zulinski, why? If you disagree, if you think sweatshops are bad, all things considered, what are the key assumptions that are made and what are the key assumptions that are missing from Zulinski's analysis? And there's some really interesting things to explore there. I mean, remember, economics gets us into the, into the realm of, so positive statements and positive economics really well gets us to the doorstep of being able to do normative analysis, which brings in values and judgments and opinions. And sometimes people will do the will do something closer to the area of normative economics. That's not my interest at all. But I want to give you the tools to be able to analyze these things. And so if you are very strongly in favor or very strongly against sweatshops, however is the case, uh, you you can stand to benefit from thinking about these ideas, evaluating the arguments, and thinking about the economic issues and our larger understanding about economic growth and development because it's really important for policy. Okay, so in the first paper I want to think about, or the first video I'm thinking about this paper, is there consumer demand for improved labor standards? Evidence from field experiments in pro social product labeling. So the basic idea is the authors worked with a store to be able to affix labels to goods and then look and see what's happened to demand for those products. So that's what I'll talk about. All right, so the starting point, the motivation is realizing, you know, there's concerns about sweatshops. People are, people don't like the fact that sweatshops exist. We don't like a situation where workers receive low wages, long working hours in unsafe and unsanitary conditions. We don't like child labor and so on and so forth. And then the question is, all right, given that these things exist, well, what can we do about it? All right. So uh, the next observation is the role of like labor unions and human rights groups certainly campaigning against trade agreements that involve firms that uh, hire and contract out what we might consider to be sweatshop labor. And there's been lobbying activities for labor standards and regulation, not just in the importing country, but also in the exporting country. And so this is interesting. Uh, the authors observe the fact that, well, an alternative to having some type of international regulation might be some market-based approach involving some voluntary, often third-party certification, and the labeling of products by firms that have adopted certain labor standards. And to the extent that consumers care, they ought to favor the, the, labeled, the goods that are labeled as having been produced under these certain labor standards. Actually, that's sort of in this paper, um, the working paper I've got with Martin Dufenberg, we're kind of taking seriously the idea that uh, individuals in who are consumers in, in the parts of the world that are buying these products might be able to exercise, uh, might be able to exercise their preference. We use psychological game theory to, um, to in, in some sense, uh, punish firms who are not being, uh, not, not um, treating their workers uh, correctly. All right, so anyway, so in this present paper, they conduct a field experiment. So this is going back to 2005. Uh, examining consumer responses to the social labeling of products. And once again, very often people like to disregard or discount older papers. I think that's a mistake. So very often the advice might be, oh, you restrict your search to papers from the last five or 10 years. So by these standards, as I'm making this video now in 2020, we would exclude a paper before 2010. I think that's a mistake. There's obviously been good work that's done previously. And to the extent that there might be some 
earlier paper that's interesting but has now become outdated, that is now an opportunity to go and revisit and to redo that particular paper later on. How are you going to do that if you don't pay attention to the fact that it exists, right? It's just, I think it's absolutely, I, I think it's ridiculous that we, that very often students and sometimes very often like young researchers are taught to ignore older papers. It's, it's, I don't know why we do that. So um, anyway, so they're in this particular paper, what they've done is conducted a field experiment where they've actually worked with a company to label products as having been produced under good labor conditions, which I'll discuss in a second. As a result, like what are some of their findings? Well, they noticed that sales actually rose when the products were labeled as being made under good labor standards. Now that's ambiguous, so I'll have to define what we mean by good labor standards, but I'll talk about that in a second. And in terms of like the magnitude, they noticed, well, demand increased with price rises of 10 to 20% above the unlabeled levels, right? So demand is increasing while price is rising, right? Think about the law of demand. When price rises, quantity demanded falls. Now for demand to increase, that's a shift of the demand curve. It's not a change in price, right? So if we had just a change in price, that'd be a violation of the law of demand. Well, that's not what's happening here. How can you get an increase in, how can you get an increase in demand here as price are rising, well, something else is happening, right? We have to have something other than price changing. Namely, they've activated consumers' taste and preferences for these products, right? So by virtue of having labeled the products, probably two, two ways we can explain an increase in demand, a rightward shift, meaning a greater quantity purchased at every price or a higher willingness to pay for a given quantity, is that there's more buyers in the market for those products by virtue of now seeing this label at their that, that's going to entice them to buy. Also, this maybe shifts consumer taste and preferences towards those labeled products. So, all right, so that's so, sort of like basic principles of economics um, now kind of getting us up to speed here. All right, so that said, they're observing, well, social labeling, think of like fair trade or think about organic or think about, you know, fair labor standards, so on and so forth, has issues, like there's some problems. Firstly, consumers have to be able to trust that the labels are what they say they are, right? So we know in the food market, so there's like just regular conventional food, there is organic, USDA or organic labeled food, and then there is food that is just labeled as natural or all natural ingredients and so on and so forth. And natural is this sort of uh, this sort of messy category that can mean kind of anything. And so consumers are becoming suspicious of that in the, from the context of like the food market. But in general, with labels, you know, there might be a lack of trust. One of the problems is producers have a strong incentive to misrepresent working cond conditions if they can get away with it. If they say that there's just like good labor practices or fair labor practices or whatever, consumers don't know what that means. Consumers are going are to give a very charitable or optimistic view. It might be that the working conditions are no different than anywhere else or they're, they're maybe even slightly worse or maybe just a little bit better. Either way, the producers can be can be sort of uh, riding on this confusion in the minds of consumers. Another problem is, well, if labeling is really popular, firms might keep the labor costs low but charge a high price, making all sorts of deceptive claims. This is I've mentioned, right? They so here they charge the high price, but they keep their labor they keep their labor costs low and therefore like pocket the the difference, the premium that consumers are willing to pay. Like if this is true, or if this happens on a large scale, and even if it's not. Problem is consumers can lose confidence in the labels, start ignoring them, and then it, they sort of diminishes the, the effect of having the label in the first place. Also, another related problem is, well, the specific standards in the labeling programs might be very controversial. So for instance, uh, how we treat child labor, right? So in the developed world, in the United States, we think very, very unfavorably towards child labor. We don't want to be consuming products that were that were created by, uh, that were produced by children. On the other hand, it could be this. It could be this the type of circumstance where a limit on child labor might make a bad, dire situation even worse for poor families, since eliminating jobs, eliminating jobs for children might not mean a proportionate increase in labor demands for adults. I mean, think about like even historically in the United States, especially like in in the agricultural industry with farming and. Think about like uh, large farm families where everybody's pitching in and doing some chores, even from a really young age. Um, so the analog from the sort of relatively subsistence, um, relatively subsistence existence might be 
you know, children working and doing some type of factory work, which we find, you know, abhorrent in, in the U.S., but that very well might be the reality for some families. And interestingly, there's been some, there's been some relatively compelling survey research where families that, you know, both parents are in the, and the children are all working and the families themselves articulate the preference that the children are allowed to continue working because that's what they need to be able to do to survive. So this is like, there's a, a whole continuum of really interesting issues to explore. Firstly, is the story that I just told, is that a true characterization of the real world? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, or to the extent to which it is actually true. That's one question. Another question is, if those are indeed the circumstances, what do we do? Do we allow a circumstance where children are persisting in uh, labor to, do we, do we maintain the status quo or do we try to make big changes, even if the changes are really painful in the short run? I mean, there's a lot of really important issues here, especially the fact that, well, if children are working in, in jobs, they are not attaining the same level of human capital, in particular education, that's going to serve them well later on in their life. And so there's a whole collection of, but so these issues, I just want to kind of put these aside. I just want to point out, well, people across the world take very different views towards child labor. Um, and so that's kind of an issue in terms of like, well, do we do we think this is something that's overall making people better off or worse off? How do we feel about it? Okay, so it's messy, right? It's really messy. All right, so another thing is, well, importers and retailers might skim too much off the top, take a big cut of the premium that consumers are paying for labels, right? In other words, this becomes a very inefficient means of directing aid to developing nations, right? So if we think about this as a way to be able to transfer wealth and to be able to make those who are least well off better off, there might be more effective ways than just than just these labels in terms of like how much of that contribution actually is benefiting those who are the worst off. All right, so the fundamental reason for being wary of labeling is, well, maybe consumers simply don't care enough. And so this is often suggested, maybe people care more about their own budget, their own wallet, than they do about the circumstances of people on the other side of the world. However, the authors cite this 1999 survey from Program and International Policy Attitudes finding 76% of, of respondents would pay an extra $5 for a garment being certified as having not been made in a sweatshop. Right. So, And this is actually a relatively robust finding. People are willing to pay for confirmation or for certification that the products that they're consuming are produced under uh, under good conditions or at least not can not produced under bad conditions so heretofore there's been little evidence as to whether or not consumers actually alter their spending patterns so we have this observation that indeed yeah people say that they're willing to pay more for products but will they really and so that's the purpose of this field experiment. So what they did is they worked with ABC Carpet and Home in New York City, so this is Manhattan, between June and October, so summer into fall of 2005. There's a large you know, volume of customers per week, 22,000. So that's bigger than, bigger than a lot of like, uh, bigger than a lot of cities and small towns, right? Um, it has a reputation for being committed to social and environmental causes. That's actually really relevant to this paper or to this to this study. Now, on the one hand, like if you're able to find actual consumer buying behavior in favor of these pro-social labeling, you might as well look at a place where you're going to find it. So if it was the case that they didn't find an effect at this place, you wouldn't expect to find it anywhere else. And so I don't really hold it against them that they went to a place where you might actually find the phenomena that they're hoping to study, but that is worth pointing out. All right, this particular store sells a range of products aimed at benefiting marginalized groups in developing nations. So for instance, um, handcrafted items from uh, refuge in Afghanistan. All right, so one thing that's really important though, as I was mentioning, these are not your typical consumers. These are consumers who are willing and able to pay relatively high prices to begin with and for high-end home furnishings. Also, by virtue of the fact that they're shopping at the store, possibly care more about social and environmental issues. So my point is, well, this might challenge external validity to some extent. They're certainly looking for an example of a market for fair labor stand, or they're looking for an example of a market where consumers might actually respond to the, this labeling is the point. All right, so in order to be able to do this experiment, authors had to select products with different options. So also they had to be able to verify the conditions, whether, you know, to 
be able to be confident that the label wasn't misleading, that it actually was the case. The products were produced without forced or child labor in safe and healthy workplaces. They had to look for reputable producers with facilities located in places typically associated with high labor standards. So what they did is they found towels made by Christie, a British brand, and Visana, Italian brand, which were displayed side by side in the store. The prices were something like $7 for hand towels and then $60 for bath towels. Now the price that becomes relevant for thinking about like price elasticity of demand, right? Um, anyway, so they confirmed the locations where they had been produced, confirmed that they are produced under good labor standards. And then what they did is they first put the labels on the Christie brand by random selection, and then they label, uh, they later switched the label to the other brand. They also, in addition to studying towels, they looked to see p consumers' behavior over candles. So they considered Santa Fe and then Way Out Wax. These were again displayed side by side ranging from $5 up to $35 for the different size of candles. Again, they confirmed the production standards and uh, started off the experiment with the labels on the Santa Fe, Santa Fe brand. Here was the sign that they had. So the label, that, the label was displayed as a sign near the products. It said, for instance, these well, towels or candles have been produced under fair labor conditions in a safe and healthy working environment, which is free of discrimination, where management has committed to respecting the rights and dignity of workers. Right? Actually, the store requested that they wouldn't make a specific reference to sweatshops or child labor, probably because of like the priming issue, right? to avoid the negative ideas or images in the mind of consumers to, invoke making, to avoid making those, um, those ideas salient. All right. So besides the label, they were able to raise the prices of labeled products up to 20%. They made a limited number of price changes in 10 to 20% increments, and then they were able to chart and see what happened through these price increases. So the way that this proceeded was first they had this baseline phase where they observed and recorded the sales of towels and candles without any labeling or without any changes in price. Then they added the label, left the prices the same. Then they the label remained and they raised the prices by 10% over the initial baseline. Then they raised the price by what would bring it to the total of 20% above the initial baseline. Then they removed the label and all the, product, all the prices went back to the baseline level. And then they applied the label to the other brand for the towel experiment to be able to do the same thing again. Now, labeling the Christie towels immediately raised sales versus Bassana, which had been unlabeled, and the units increased by 11.5%, dollar revenue by 4.7%. Raising prices of Christie by 10% and then by 20% accentuated the effect with increases of like 21% and then you know 4.3% respectively. So the interesting thing is that as they raise the price, consumers' uh, willingness to pay or the amount that consumers were buying went up as well, which suggests actually kind of two things. So firstly, you've got the fact that, well, as the label's being attached, um, people see, oh, this has been produced under good conditions, and so therefore, uh, maybe I want to patronize this particular product. The other thing is there might be a belief in the minds of consumers that, in, that there's cost associated with it. That, hey, look, the one that's produced under good labor standards is going to cost more, and by virtue of, in some sense, voting with my dollars, I'm supporting or I'm subsidizing these additional wages to these, to these workers, which is actually like sort of a, a brilliant way to be able to sort of activate the sort of warm glow preferences in the minds of consumers and to be able to, to the extent that that's actually, uh, th that's actually the case, that can be kind of a really powerful way to, uh, to be able to uh, allow people's charitable inclinations to you know, benefit workers by virtue of their purchasing decisions, actually kind of an idea. So anyway, uh, price elasticity of demand is positive for the initial 10% increase and then, so uh, pretty responsive, and then, um, and then 0.41 still positive for the second 10% increase, right? So price elasticity of demand is supposed to be negative or we reported an absolute value. What's going on here is we're getting, as the price increase, the quantity demand is rising. So it looks like you're moving up a demand curve. No, no, that's not what's happening. Remember, what's happened is a rightward shift of demand. There's been an increase in demand in this market, All right? So what's going on? Well, maybe it's the case that shoppers are reasoning that the towels made under the better conditions are going to need to be priced higher because they're more, there's bigger costs. 
Um, interestingly, while relative numbers of the labeled versus unlabeled uh, products did decline with the price increase, revenues kept rising. Uh, some shoppers began switching to the lower price candle, for instance, and this was less evident for the larger candles. I mean, who knows, maybe they're less substitutable when you're getting, when you're, when you're getting to the larger candles. Right, so as a result, sort of reflecting on, this, on the study here, the evidence is suggestive that social labeling programs hold potential for being able to activate consumers' preferences for pro-social uh, outcomes, such as labor standards. As a result, they found well sales rising, demand increasing, given you know even in the even in the circumstance where there's a price increase. Reflect on this, like what's an interesting what's what's going on here is interesting, and we might wonder why don't other firms do this? Why don't other firms do the same thing? Well, the first issue is well, it's difficult to get credible and substantial social labeling initiatives in place, right? You have to have cooperation with some. Um, independent humanitarian org organization to be able to certify it. for it to be uh, for it to be valid for it to be legitimate there's got to be some type of certification and that's hard to do especially across many products also the firms might consider it really risky to do this type of public market research on labor standards labeling right to be able to test this out to see if this works for their own consumers in their own stores uh, here's sort of some insight into that riskiness Several firms declined to participate with the authors of the study because they couldn't actually vouch for the labor standards in all their factories and couldn't afford negative publicity if journalists or activist groups got attracted by these experiment labels on only a few items and then use that as an opportunity to target them for the lack of labels on other products. And so, I mean, that was a concern in 2005. In 2020, I would imagine... It'd be very difficult to redo this field experiment, would be, my, would be my guess. All right, so the label placed on Santa Fe, well, there's an increase of 26.2% in units sold, 7.7 in dollar revenues, raising prices by 10 and 20%, just like the towels accentuated the effect. And the price elasticity of demand uh, was positive for the initial, actually negative for the second 10% for the, for the candles. <laughs> I'm reading this, I'm like, I should have put this slide two slides ago. So sorry about that. But um, usually like during a regular you know, presentation, I kind of click around and go back. Can't do that here in the video. So um, anyway, sorry about that. Uh, the next thing I guess I'll talk about this now is the paper I've got in progress with Martin Dufenberg. Uh, this is using psychological game theory, in particular reciprocity preferences arguing that reciprocity sentiments in the developed world amongst those buying products can be used to alleviate sweatshop conditions. And the basic idea is uh, we take a model of sequential reciprocity and apply this in the context of a, of a market where you have consumers who are buying products from firms who hire workers. And to the extent that consumers are aware that the workers are not being adequately compensated, we might expect that consumers will avoid buying products from those firms. They'll be unkind to firms that are being unkind to workers. Now, this is interesting. So the, the paper that this is that, that the model comes from is uh, is uh, Dufenberg and Kirstiger. Um, it's a sequential reciprocity equilibrium. So they introduce that in the context of psychological game theory between individuals one to one. So if you're kind to me, I'll be kind to you. If you're unkind to me, I'll be unkind to you. And this is sort of a model of belief dependent preferences. What we're doing in this paper is we're saying we're introducing a third person. So we're saying um, it's not possible for the sweatshop worker to have any type of um, any type of reciprocity with the firm that's by nature, by definition of being a sweatshop worker. It's not really possible for the consumer to interact directly with the worker. However, the firm interacts with the worker, the consumer interacts with the firm. And so you get this sort of indirect effect where the reciprocity can be transferred. So if, if a consumer views the firm as being unkind to the worker, then the consumer is going to be unkind to the firm by virtue of just like not buying their product. And so anyway, it's kind of an interesting paper. Um, looking forward to sort of finishing up. But um, anyway, it has to do with applications of psychological game theory, in particular belief-dependent preferences. And that's something interesting to, the, to discuss. I'll bring that up a little bit later in the course. All right, so I'm going to conclude this video here. This is part one of the Sweatshops 
uh, series of lectures. Part two is going to be thinking about Zwolinski's contributions to thinking about uh, arguments in favor of sweatshops. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and conclude. hope you enjoyed the video. I'll see you in the next one.